Hello, welcome to Post-Colonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'll continue my con conversation about Michel Foucault's What is an Author? I had already previously recorded part one of this conversation, and today I'll be talking to you about part two. Of course, these are arbitrary part twos, but if you recall in part one, Foucault lays out his argument is, is that he needs to answer the question of the author. And the ne reason he needs to answer it is because his own work, The Order of Things, was criticized under two grounds, right? And I described that in the first part of the video. And then he goes on to say that there are two thematics under which we can discuss the state of writing. One is the writing itself has become too elusive, too much about the signifier, which is caught within a structure and not necessarily compositional, where you take something and represent it in a text, right? And two, the second part of the thematic is that the writing today in his time is concerned with the death of the author. And by that he is referring to Barth, right? But what he says is that the author is no longer sought after or present in the text. The text and what it does, what the language does, has been accorded privilege. Now because of this he goes on to suggest that the author should have completely vanished from any kind of consideration. But it does not happen. And that is what he is trying to describe in this part that I am going to discuss. What are the two things that are mobilized to erase the author but that end up stabilizing the idea of the author, the name of the author, the function of the author, right? Now remember, he is trying to discuss what is an author, but this is Michel Foucault. He will build these little building blocks. Some of them will rely heavily on contemporary philosophical debates and some of those are obvious digs at the people that he disagrees with. Keep that in mind. Another cautionary note is that none of these videos can ever teach you everything. Okay, The most important part of this experience for you and me both is to read the text carefully, then read the footnotes, and then maybe watch this video and make up your mind. So I'll read a part of where his argument about these two themes that restrain the erasure of the author. I will read that part and then go on to discuss those two thematics in this part two of this series. Okay, so here we go. If we wish to know the writer in our day, it will be through the singularity of his absence and in his link to death which has transformed him into a victim of his own writing. While all of this is familiar in philosophy as in literary criticism, I am not certain that the consequences derived from the disappearance or death of the author have been fully explored or that the importance of this event has been appreciated. To be specific, it seems to me that the themes destined to replace the privileged position accorded the author have merely served to arrest the possibility of genuine change. Of these, I will examine two that seem particularly important. So as we continue reading, we realize that the first constraint out of the two themes that he has chosen to discuss is our affiliations with the term work. Now remember there is a reference here also to Barth's distinction between the work and a text, but by and large what he is suggesting is that the moment we invoke the term work it presupposes an author, right? And then there are several questions that arise from it. Right? Is there one singular author for a body of work collected together from someone? If we wanted to produce a definitive collected works of Nietzsche, what would we include in it? How would we make those decisions? Right? Would all his footnotes be included in it? Would all his rough drafts would be included in it? All of these decisions presuppose an authorial figure, that is Nietzsche. 
Similarly, he says that even if you go back, right, to the times where the figure of the author was not necessarily connected to a body of work, well, some of those works are collected under the name of an author, right? So for as long as we invoke the term work, whether it be collected or an individual work, it already places us within a dynamic of an author or a figure that produced that work, right? So this is the first thing, this reliance on a certain loose definition and understanding of what he considers under theorized consideration of work itself or collected works itself precludes us from believing or acquiescing to this total death of the author or erasure of the author because the figure of the author loosely is still connected to the question of the work like complete works or just the work the signifier work that is the first theme that he talks about that precludes us or hinders us from taking our writing or our thinking to simply beyond the figure of the author. So keep that in mind. Okay, so the second practice that according to Foucault in this essay constrains us from believing in total erasure of the author and his or her connection to the work is reliance on a creature. Right? So a creature, of course, this is a dig at Derrida, right? The idea of the creature or arch trace or arch creature in Derrida is in his argument when he's trying to suggest that writing produce, precedes speech, right? What he's trying to say is that even before we speak, there is writing, right? And our thought is conceived in that primordial mode of writing itself, right? I'm simplifying Derrida's argument. But what Foucault is saying is, okay, if we buy into this concept of an a priori within which the language falls, a structure of writing within which speech falls, then all we are doing is instead of attributing a work to an individual author, right? We are re-invoking the transcendental signifier, something outside of language, maybe God, maybe something spiritual that gives meaning to a text, to a work. So hence the author may not be an individual author, but the pre-existence of writing of this story outside of language, but which determines language itself, then keeps the figure of the author alive, but more importantly as a theological figure right so religion or this belief in writing beyond writing writing that precedes writing you know the tyranny of the a priori right what exists before even i speak so this is the second thing which should have erased the individual author but it reinstates a larger than life a transcendental authorial figure to whom we are, or authorial structure to whom we attribute all acts of writing. So, by associating an author to a work or collected works or whatever you want to call it, and by privileging a pre-structure that is like writing, that pre-exists speech, what he's saying is that both of these things were meant to eliminate the figure of the author, but they end up reinforcing the figure of the transcendental signifier the author, God, or whatever you want to call it, or the work that must presuppose someone who wrote it, right? These are the two thematics that he's saying are precluding us in his time to completely erase the figure of the author. So as we wade through his argument, what we are also learning is how Foucault builds his argument by by referring to previous works, but by also defining and discussing the constituent parts of his argument. And that's something good to learn simply by reading this essay. So I'm going to stop here. This might sound really short, right? But since this is a dense essay, I will conclude today's discussion of the two thematics that he thinks hinder us from believing in the total erasure of the author and then come back 
and read further into how he discusses the figure of the author or the name of the author or what he calls the author function. I hope this is useful to you. Let me know what you think and as always feel free to send me your suggestions. I love your comments. I cannot answer very complex questions in the comments but you know if it is something that I can manage in the comments I'll try to answer that. I hope you're all doing well and taking care of each other. I will now be back with the next part of this wonderful essay by Michel Foucault. Until then, take care, stay safe and as always, peace and love.